You might be forgiven for thinking that I'm a pessimist, that the Low Technology Institute's blog, podcast, publications, and presentation often focus on the coming collapse when fossil fuels are less abundant, that we are giddily awaiting the crash of our energy-intensive way of life, and that we cheer on each figurative piece of straw put on the camel's back as the inevitable break approaches. But at heart, we're optimists, and a future that has less energy available doesn't have to be worse, it just has to be different. We argue that the sooner we embrace this future, the sooner that we can create a more sustainable, resilient, and local life, uh, the better. And we're not alone in this way of thinking. This is the Low Tech Podcast. Welcome, I'm Scott Johnson from the Low Technology Institute, your host for podcast number 49 on June 10th, 2022, coming to you out of the, usually out of the Low Tech Institute's gardens in Cooksville, Wisconsin, but today it's raining. Thank you for joining us. This week we are glad to share the first half of a longer interview I gave to the Doomer Optimism podcast. We'll also have institute updates. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is low underscore techno. Like us on Facebook, find us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and check out our website, lowtechinstitute.org. There you can find both of our podcasts as well as information about joining and supporting the Institute and its research. Also, some podcast distributors put ads on podcasts. And unless you hear me doing the ads, someone else is making money on that advertising. And while all of our podcasts, videos, and other information are given freely, they do take resources to make. And if you're in a position to help support our work and be part of this community, please consider becoming a monthly supporter for as little as $3 a month through our Patreon page, patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute. Thanks to Ingrid S. for joining since our last podcast. If you'd like to sponsor an episode directly, please get in touch with us through our website, lowtechinstitute.org. This episode is brought to you by Sunshine. We know you have a choice of electromagnetic radiation, and we hope you consider the light coming from the G-type main sequence star at the center of our solar system. While nuclear power meltdowns and distant stars might claim to offer better radiation, wouldn't you rather stick to the source that supported life on Earth for over 3.5 billion years? Warning, solar radiation, too high an amount may cause skin cancer. Do not touch the sun, do not look at the sun, do not think about the sun expanding into a red dwarf in 5 billion years, engulfing Mercury and Venus, and rendering the Earth into a blasted hellscape. Visit lowtechinstitute.org slash about slash support to sponsor an episode. Today we'll be listening in on an interview I had with Dr. Ashley Colby and John Kearns on the Doomer Optimism podcast. Their podcast is, quote, dedicated to discovering regenerative paths forward, highlighting the people working for a better world, and connecting seekers to doers, end quote. They put out two episodes a week, and while you can find all their offerings at doomeroptimism.com, the podcast is available under the same name on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Google, and others. They've drawn from a broad swath of people who are actively working towards a more sustainable and resilient future, and their message will resonate with anyone listening to the Low Tech Podcast. Okay, let's get right into it. Hey, welcome everybody to a new episode of the Doomer Optimism Podcast. Today, Ashley and I are talking with Scott Johnson, who is the founder and director of the Low Technology Institute. Scott, why don't you introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your backstory and how you came to found the Low right. Tech Institute and the kind of stuff that you guys work on. Sure. So, well, I guess in the beginning, I started in northern Minnesota. That's where I'm from. Uh, kind of lived all over um, through an exchange year abroad and in Germany, and then came back and went to college in Boston and then New Orleans uh, for grad school. And that was all archaeology, mostly. I'm, I'm an archaeologist by training, um, and I finished my PhD in anthropology, uh, which is kind of the umbrella for archaeology and a couple other social sciences. And uh, I was teaching and just was on the adjunct treadmill, which I'm sure we don't need to get into today. Um, and I, I just kind of started thinking about society in general, large scale, uh, rise and fall of ancient civilizations. And I was writing a book at the time called uh, Why Ancient Civilizations Failed, which was not my title. I wanted to call it Hubris, uh, which is something we can talk about if you want. Um, but basically, my idea was that societies become so enamored of themselves that they stop paying attention to changing environmental factors. I don't just mean climate environment. I mean things around them, their surroundings. And then when they, uh, <laughs> when they stop paying attention to their surroundings, things change and then they collapse because they think, oh, we've farmed this way for a thousand years and it's worked. So why would we change? Right. And then of course, uh, 
being the all saying eye of Sauron myself, I looked at these ancient civilizations, bad word, I know, complex societies, uh, and then I looked at our own and I thought, well, we're kind of uh, addicted to fossil fuels and we haven't planned for the end of those. And I kind of got depressed <laughs> um, and uh, found places like the Dark Mountain Project and others uh, who were kind of on the same page. And eventually I said, okay, enough with this academic run around. I'm going to start doing something where I can do hands-on research projects um, and uh, center them around small scale DIY solutions to a lot of how we're going to live after fossil fuels are no longer around. Um, so there's, I guess, kind of the doomer part, my, my depression about where we're going and the optimism part about, hey, there are things you can do right now that not only make you more resilient in a future without fossil fuels, but also today when prices go up, it's like, okay, grocery store prices are going up. I don't care because we grow a lot of our own food and it's not like we have a lot of land to do it on. You can grow a lot of your own food in your own space. So stuff like that. Uh, that's kind of what we're all about. We're a 501c3 nonprofit and we uh, have a research wing. <laughs> it makes it sound very grand. A research wing that does uh, research on thing, everything from growing potatoes, solar hot water, um, and breeding bees and growing, growing food, a lot of it's food related. Um, and then we have an educational wing where we have classes on a lot of the topics we cover. Um, next year, we hope to do a whole series on timber framing as we build a building for our institute, things like that. So we're trying to do a lot of stuff, hands-on, local, small-scale stuff. Uh, that's, that's basically what we're all about. Cool. Well, that's a great sort of a 30,000 foot view. Um, Super interesting stuff going on. I want to mention the Low Tech Institute's website, lowtechinstitute.org. Oh, yeah. Great website. I've been exploring it. I think a person could easily spend a month looking through all the resources you got on there. You've got videos, you've got podcasts, you've got a lot of how to stuff, you've got descriptions of the projects that you've worked on, you've got white papers and other sort of philosophical materials and stuff. So I definitely encourage everybody to go see lowtechinstitute.org and check out the stuff you got. Um, I want to step th through things a little bit slower and yeah. maybe ask you questions about your process and things that were formative for you. So you did your PhD in archaeology and anthropology, and you worked a lot mm -hmm. with Mayan communities in Mesoamerica, Latin America. So could you give like a little description of the kind of stuff that you were doing with those communities and maybe some salient experiences that you had, what you learned working sure. with those communities and how it's affected your path? Yeah. Uh, so uh, what you guys were talking about on a previous episode actually resonated with me because uh, I know you've had lots of people on who have worked in different um, parts of the, of the I guess you'd call it uh, less industrialized uh, part of the world, um, which is, I think, a, a better phrasing than, say, more or less developed because it assumes development is required. Um, yeah, so I lived in Guatemala for a while. Um, I also lived most of my, my um, time working in the field was in Mexico in a small village uh, just south of Chichen Itza, which is uh, many people know. Um, I was 15 minutes south of there, but kind of a world away because uh, 15 minutes away was Chichen Itza where they had the buses coming in with thousands of tourists every day and you know, very first world sort of experience. Uh, and then I was 15 minutes away, but you know, never went to town. Uh, to get a cell phone signal, I had to climb up the tallest tree on the tallest pyramid, and then I could call home. Um, and uh, so, you know, so, so still connected, but barely. Um, and so, you know, we had like one outlet in our in the house we lived in. And so this was um, an experience that that touched me a lot because people have been living in so many different ways across the, the ancient world and today that it makes me so uh, disappointed that sometimes we get such a narrow view of what it is to live a good life. Um, and I don't want to romanticize um, uh, living the way that they did uh, or the, that they do um, in, in rural parts of, of Mexico because there are, you know, access to healthcare um, and uh, over influx of, of uh, processed sugars and processed foods nowadays has uh, given rise to high diabetes and a lot of health conditions. So that and uh, education and all, uh, many, many, I could list, right? There's, there's a lot of, uh, of difficulty. So I don't mean to romanticize it, but the fact that, you know, if, um, if something terrible, catastrophic were to happen uh, to world trade, uh, I, I think they would continue to live a lot more comfortably than many of us would. Um, and that made me 
happy, happy and, and sad, I guess. Uh, but I, I don't know. I think about, I think about it and I try and draw ideas from them and then, uh, from not only, only them, but across the world, uh, both today and in the past and, and, and take those ideas and analyze them in a bit of a more scientifically rigorous way with a control and an, and, a, and an experimental, uh, plots of different vegetables or different plants I'm growing or methods I'm using to kind of get a comparison. Cause a lot of people in the alternative, um, agriculture or alternative uh, energy or alternative XYZ community, uh, they'll say, oh, this is a great idea. I'm going to try it. And they try it. But there's no control. So you don't know if, if it's, if it's doing better than, than, than it would otherwise. So, um, so yeah, I try, I try and draw from them uh, and, and draw from that type of idea. Uh, but also, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to technological solutions when they're necessary. And for example, we're on zoom right now. And I don't think uh, anyone listening on a podcast would be able to listen to, to these ideas um, if we didn't have the communication infrastructure that we do. So, so there are some things that I think are important to try and preserve as we move in transition into this brave new world uh, that's coming at us, whether we like it or not. Um, whereas some things uh, that I think we can jettison pretty easily. So um, people hear that you're an archaeologist and that mm -hmm. you're you know, living and working in the Yucatan. They're going to think that you're maybe going around digging up bones and, and old uh, pyramid sites and stuff like that. So when you were there working with the communities there, what, <laughs> were you running around digging up bones and stuff, or were you studying contemporary practices? Were you studying ancient practices? Or what were you focused on? Sure. Uh, so for me, uh, at least for my dissertation, which has the, the actual topic of my dissertation had only in a very, very broad sense anything to do with what I'm doing today, um, I was looking at... Uh, a complex political change in the past. Um, and so, yes, I was going around uh, every day. We'd walk two kilometers out to the site from the village I was staying in of about 300 people who grew up speaking Maya as their primary language and then learned Spanish um, in school. And so we'd uh, walk out to the site every day and we would, um, first we had to survey. So we had to cut uh, straight lines through the forest and um, use uh, survey equipment and, and identify where all the structures were and the topography of the land. Um, to kind of recreate what this this little tiny village looked like. It was about the same size as the village we lived in now. And then uh, the next year we did uh, surface collections and excavations to get pottery. We were primarily focused on pottery because a uh, pottery sequence changes over time. Just like, um, you know, if you were digging through a trash bin or a, a trash pit from, you know, the last century, you'd see different Coke bottles because Coke bottles change over time and you could then date which each layer was, right? So um, we basically were doing that but with pottery that was a thousand years old. And what we were looking at with all this, you know, just little mundane bits of everyday pottery that, you know, John Q. Maya just kind of threw out when it broke um, was actually a really interesting change in that um, for four or five, 600 years, there was a local uh, large scale uh, more or less socio-political control uh, or regime. And then um, after what's called the Maya collapse, which interestingly uh, affected two interesting points in the Maya collapse, which some people like to talk about. Um, number one, collapse is kind of a, a loaded word because the thing that collapsed were the upper levels of societies, the, the people that were building the large pyramids, the rulers, the, the, the people that were not subsistence farmers. Subsistence farmers largely just scattered into the forest and picked up and continued living. So there was a lot of resilience and it affected 10% of the population a lot. So saying it was a collapse is a little disingenuous. Um, and number two, it happened more in the southern area that was more dependent on rainfall. Where I worked was practically a desert. Um, it was a scrub, I forget the exact uh, Copeland designation of it, but it was a scrub forest near a desert. It was, it was pretty, it was kind of like Texas. It was pretty hot, dry limestone, no water stayed on the surface, uh, very, very little soil. Anyway, so these people weathered the drought really well because they already had drought resilient strategies. Um, so they just kind of kept chugging along. And then what happened to them was, a maritime empire uh, that Chichen Itza represents came in and was an intrusion. And then they, so I was looking at this little village that was equidistant between, almost equidistant between Chichen Itza and the old capital. And I wanted to see how did this so-called massive shift from one regime to another uh, manifest itself on the local level for small everyday people. And it didn't really. I mean, they just paid tribute to someone else. So they didn't care. I mean, they're, as far as I could tell, very little change. So a lot of times when we think of these big catastrophic world ending changes, 
a lot of that doesn't affect the, the little people. Now, this was at a time when people were subsistence farmers and could go out into the landscape and create their own living, um, which is kind of different than, than most of us today. Um, you know, maybe present company excluded, uh, but they're, you know, they're, for the majority of population, um, a disruption of that level would be catastrophic to their day, daily way of life. And so that, in addition to other things, kind of pushed me to say, okay, well, can we build this resilience into our lives now, knowing that we do have this change coming, um, you know, uh, make ourselves more, more resilient and more self Self-sufficient also is a word I'm trying to get away for. Uh, maybe locally, locally resilient or locally sufficient rather than self-sufficient. Because I think in America we all like to be think we could be self-sufficient, but nobody's self-sufficient unless you are able to get ore out of the ground and become a blacksmith and do all of these things. You are not self-sufficient. Like you, you know, yeah. Uh, and do that with everything. Uh, you are not self-sufficient. You are interdependent on other people around you. Yep even as a rugged individualist out on the um, frontier. Yes. Okay. This is so good. I can totally see the straight line between your research and um, the low tech Institute, because it's basically like in the, in the situation where there's like complex uh, systems collapse, uh, people can still thrive if they're able to sort of like meet their needs. Um on like a local right. or community or bioregional level. So um, it's so, it very much ties in with all the, a lot of the stuff we talk about is just, I think a lot of people who have studied history or lived in the developing world think this similar uh, or, you know, less industrialized world, uh, think in the similar way, which is like, um, you know, I think uh, realizing how precarious our lives are those of us who don't have these skills and have very little ability to um, provide for our own basic needs. And so like preparing for that in advance is, um, is smarter than not doing it. Um, this is, it, it, there's so much overlap too with my experience and maybe Josh's experience too. It might be interesting. Um, we talked a little bit about it on your podcast or, you know, when we interviewed you, Josh, but um, I do think there is something to spending time outside of the developed world, like the hyper industrial world to give you a set of perspective, like, you know, a, a perspective about how other people live, um, how, how um, it's pretty accessible to uh, live sustainably and with low resource input um, on a community level. And it's, you realize like you don't need a ton of resources to get by, to eat, to have warm water, uh, a place, a, a warm and dry place to sleep. Um, I, um, I traveled to Guatemala um, and had this similar kind of insight at the Pyramid Tikal. Do you know that one? Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. just like, just see, seeing like, yeah, there was this a uh, complex civilization and, and, you know, it, it, it sort of went away, but you know, like <laughs> we persist throughout time. So, okay. One thing that a lot of people who are, I think, uh, thinking in this type of way, um, had this kind of set of experience interested in, in complex societies of the past are like trying to figure out what can we draw from the past? What can we draw from anthropology? Um, the study of, of past civilizations, like what's relevant for us and what's, um, what should we be modeling, but obviously like in the modern context. And so one thing that um, has been coming up a, a bunch recently is, and this would be great to get your opinion on before we get into like the more um, modern work that you're, or the work you're doing um, at LTI, but is are are there like um are, would you call what the 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 Mayan civilization or the Mayan society you were studying would you call that a civilization or not? And I there was some debate recently on Twitter um, about whether or not a civilization if once it gets to the point where it's a civilization it's necessarily unsustainable. And um I, I like mm. I, I I feel like there are lots of very extremely varied um, examples of complex societies in the past, you might call them civilizations, that lasted like very long, very like thousands of years um, with decent yeah. amount of complexity and they only collapsed because of some change in the ecosystem or change in the in climate or you know the ice age or, or the ice age going away 
these kinds of major changes. So I'm wondering, like, as an anthropologist, do you feel like it's important to make this distinction, like civilizations are unsustainable? And because then that has implications for us, right? Because I get a little frustrated sometimes where people are like, any amount of complex organization among humans is going to be unsustainable. And then it's like, well, where does that leave us? I mean, do we have to like simplify to such an extent, you know, and I think it's a little bit like this um, fetishizing indigeneity of the past and stuff like that in it too. So I don't know, I, I've been curious to hear your thoughts since you're trained in this area. Sure, sorry, I'm just taking notes because there's like seven points. <laughs> it's a complex question. We could, yeah, we could just So first of all, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, so civilization, so the term itself, civilization, it's in the title of my book, but like I said, that's not my choice because civilization has become, at least in anthropology, a dirty word because uh, you may already know, um, your listeners may already know that civilization comes from a tripartite division from uh, anthropology in like 150 years ago when there was a lot of European colonialism and they put everybody in the world into three categories. You are either a savage, a barbarian, or civilized which is really not, <laughs> we don't want to use those terms anymore. Although civilization has stuck around and become um, really, um, really, uh, really difficult to shake. So we, so that word is still here for better or worse. Um, I try not to use it. Like I said, I, I prefer the term complex societies or large scale complex societies. And that just refers to when you have a lot of people living together, it becomes incredibly complex because it's almost like a, uh, an exponential growth of complexity, the more people you have grouped together closely and communicating. Um, and so today, for example, we talk about um, maybe uh, service, uh, ban services divisions, band, tribe, chiefdom, state as ways to talk about the how uh, many people are living together. And the important thing, uh, the important difference is um, from the savage barbarian civilization idea was there was a, a, an arrow. You, everybody started out in the the savagery and then you move to barbarism and then you move to civilization so you so a lot of the colonialism was to try and pull these quote unquote i hate you i'm sorry i apologize for using this word but this is i'm just historically speaking they said we are going to these places of savagery and trying to bring them into civilization that was so that's again why we that's don't use language. that word yeah that's um, the language of the past yeah so it's really it's really yeah problematic uh i guess if you want to be um yeah historical about it anyway so Band tribe chiefdom, the important difference there is there is no presumed uh, movement from band to tribe, from tribe to chiefdom, from chiefdom to state. That's sometimes how it progresses, but that doesn't have a, a value judgment on it. A state isn't necessarily better than a band. Bands are egalitarian. Bands uh, move across the landscape. They're largely nomadic hunter-gatherers. Um, bands have uh, people in bands have long lifespans. They uh, have uh, really good health because they're not living in the same place, polluting that one environment. They're moving around. They're eating a varied diet. They actually, bands, when you move to a, a tribe or chiefdom, those are usually agricultural. And when you move from a band uh, to sedentary agricultural lifestyle, you see shorter stature, which is kind of a, um, an indication of poor and nutrition really um because it's only in the last 50 years that we have attained the height of average hunter gatherers before agriculture uh because our environment because we have such a robust um industrial food production system right now um so you know 50 years before that everyone was a lot shorter going back 10,000 years because they were eating monocrop wheat um and things like that uh so so there's, yeah, you, we're trying to get away from that value judgment. Um, so yeah, so that's that's civilization. That's why I try and use the term complex. Lar but, large so my complex question society. is then, like, if you get once you get to chiefdom state level, right. uh, uh, is it right. necessarily um, unsustainable at that level? No, no, but it's easier to be. Okay, <laughs> right. That makes um, sense. When you have, so uh, I like to say, for example, because my big bugaboo is fossil fuels, I say that. Uh, fossil fuels kind of hypercharge all the the best and the worst about us, right? They help us produce tons of food, uh, but they also help us destroy the environment at an increased rate. Um, one person with an excavator could, you know, cause so much soil damage and erosion that they could, you know, completely destroy a, a, a wetland ecosystem easily, a single person, right? I mean, that's only possible because of fossil fuels. It would be really hard to do that with a shovel. Uh, possible, but it would be a lot more 
be a more dedicated. Anyway, um, and similarly with with hundreds of or thousands of people working together in um, pre-industrial societies, uh, you know, canalization um, is a big one. Uh, deforestation is a big one. Uh, these are ways that you know more people living in a concentrated area. It's a lot easier for them to destroy their environment or change their conditions in a way that make it unsustainable in the long run. That doesn't mean it can't be sustainable. And, and a lot of people like to romanticize, um, for example, uh, Native Americans, First Nations, uh, uh, societies here, and they forget that um, when Europeans encountered Native Americans in many, many places, it was right after a plague had killed off anywhere from 15 to 90% of the population. And so you had a very diminished population living with the infrastructure and the large resources of a much larger society. And the same thing happened in Europe after the bubonic plague, um, because land is finite. As the population increases, there's less uh, resources or less land and less resources available for each individual person. And so after the bubonic plague wiped out a third of Europeans, oh, suddenly there's extra land for growing food, there's extra housing, there's all this extra availability because all of the dead people don't need it anymore. And so people actually had a boom, an economic boom, and a, and a high quality of life after all of these people died off. And so it's easy to romanticize. Um, and, and I'm not saying that we can't learn a lot of really good lessons from uh, Native American agriculture and even social organization. Um, you know, my favorite anecdote was that... Uh, a lot of native societies would divide um, property rights were matrilineal. They passed through the mothers to their daughters. And then um, a lot of the other societal uh, or organizations were, were patrilineal. They passed through men. And so women on the land, men did provide a lot of the labor. And so it was kind of a, 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 there had to be more mutual respect, right, between the two, rather than men owning a lot of the land and providing a lot of the labor. And then, yeah, it's easier to be less egalitarian. And so sometimes when the Europeans would meet, they'd want to talk to the, you know, the, 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 whoever was ruling that village. And they would think that the woman was acting as a translator for her husband when she was actually the, you know, in charge. And they kept talking to the man and he'd be like, well, ask my wife. And they, there's a lot of cultural confusion, let alone language confusion. So there's a lot of really useful things. And I don't mean to um, disregard that, but yeah, it's important to keep everything in perspective. So, um, so can large scale civilizations be su sustainable? Yes, they can, but they have to be very self-reflective. And I feel like as societies become more powerful, they become less self-reflective um, in a realistic way. Um, and they feel that they have the answers. This is how it works. And if we don't, or, and we don't need to change, we can change the world around us. And I feel like this um, really feeds on to um, our, our technophilia. You know, we will, I was just hearing a story on NPR this morning about a, 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 a hedge fund or a, some sort of thing on Wall Street where they uh, bundle a lot of uh, investments uh, for a very technological future, a very, you know, very bullish on, on technology saving us. And, you know, um, the anthropologist James C. Scott uh, has the idea of high modernism, and this is a robust, almost religious belief in technology going to save us. And I have sympathy for this. I have family members who think we're going to innovate our way out of this. And uh, I say, okay, maybe. But until that happens, I'm going to plan for things that I know work, like growing lots of potatoes, <laughs> you know, like growing wheat, uh, growing things locally, doing uh, lo being locally self-sufficient. Um, that's what I'm going to focus on until we have, you know, carbon capture that is energy neutral and all of these wonderful things that people are trying to work on. You know, everybody has a, an electric car that doesn't have a really terrible uh, supply chain for its lithium batteries and all these things on that's what it's going to be right No, uh, I, I can't predict the future, but yeah, I, I'll work. I'll, I'll focus on things that have a proven track record and make them better and more obtainable rather than, you know, refocusing on, uh, on something new that's going to save us. Yeah, theoretical. The new has gotten us into this problem. Right. Yeah. I'd like to, if it's cool, I'd like to jump in. Um, you were, if you want to hear the rest of the interview, find the Doomer Optimism podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google, and other venues. Have a look through their back catalog for other great interviews, and if you want advanced access to their episodes, you can also support them on Patreon. 
And now for a brief recap of the research we have going on around the Institute. And unfortunately, COVID swept through my family, which lives here at the Institute. First, my partner got what seemed like a cold with congestion and fatigue. She quarantined after testing positive, but the next day my son was feverish and also positive and joined her in quarantine. Two days later, my infant daughter and I also tested positive. So on the bright side, we all got to quarantine together. Thankfully, all of our symptoms were mild, uh, but with caring for people in quarantine and the usual childcare and my own illness, we've mostly been shut down for the last two weeks. I point this out not to complain, uh, but to highlight the type of redundancy and resiliency we try and build into our day-to-day -day lives. By having food on hand and other necessities available, a two-week illness is easy to weather. We didn't have to have emergency shopping trips done for us by our neighbors. We just had to think about how to keep ourselves healthy. Uh, we're working on a systematic way for folks to approach building resiliency and local subsistence into their lives. The beta version of this site is up, which you can find at lowtechinstitute.org slash transition. And we really welcome your feedback. That's it for the week. The Low Tech Podcast is put out by the Low Technology Institute. The show is hosted and co-produced by me, Scott Johnson. It's also co-produced and edited by Hina Suzuki. This episode was recorded in the Low Technology Institute. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and elsewhere. We hope you've enjoyed this free podcast. If you'd like to join the community and help support the work we do, please consider going to patreon.com slash lowtechinstitute and signing up. Thank you to our forester and land steward level members, Marilyn Skirpon and the Hambuses, for their support. The Low Technology Institute is a 501c3 research organization supported by members, grants, and underwriting. You can find out more information about the Low Technology Institute, membership, and underwriting at lowtechinstitute.org. Find us on social media and reach me directly, scott at lowtechinstitute.org. Our intro music was High on Loungin' off the self-titled album by Wax Lyricist. That song is under the Creative Commons license, and this podcast is under the Creative Commons attribution and share-like license, meaning you're free to use it and share it as long as you give us credit. Thanks, and take care.